So Alex asked me to give you guys a talk on just the basics of pediatric trauma. Um, I adapted this lecture from something I just put together for the Defense Institute for Medical Operations. I'll put in a plug for DEMO. It's an Air Force Institute um, that gives lectures to foreign militaries when they want like a refresher on specific trauma topics or whatever. It's usually framed around emergency war surgery course. And so this lecture is framed around emergency war surgery course. And some of the slides are really Spartan because it's meant to be given through translators and stuff. But I've kind of beefed it up and added some papers that I think you guys should know about uh, for the lecture. So um, we can get started. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between adult and pediatric trauma. The key is to decrease the kind of one anxiety um, due to the differences in size and the unfamiliarity with um, pediatric patients, right? So these are often high anxiety situations because we're not used to it, but I just want to reinforce that ATLS principles apply. You're going to triage them and treat them according to A, B, C, D, E, just the same way that you would do an adult. And hopefully we can give you some tricks to kind of decrease the cognitive load that comes with the different sizes and stuff. So um, one thing that can help you stay on track with your ATLS principles is to use um, these, there are very robust cognitive aids out there. Um, we have it in our ER and I encourage you to go down into the pediatric resuscitation bay and pull out the Braslow tape that's up against the wall. Um, it's a, unfortunately you have to pay for it. So it's not like something that you can just download and print off for your cash, like when you're downrange or whatever, but you could potentially buy it and stick it in your bag or something like that when you're getting deployed. Um, but it's got a lot of information on it. Uh, you, you take the top, it says the top here and you put it at the top of the kid's head and then you stretch it out along the bed toward their feet. And then you'll get a color um, range uh, that is based loosely on weight and has been validated in obese kids for our kids in the United States. Um, and they range from pink to green. Uh, and then you will see that on the tape itself, there's a lot of information regarding medication for um, rapid sequence intubation, the proposed sizes that you could possibly use for um, IVs, the depth and size of endotracheal tubes. So just right there on the tape itself is a whole lot of information that you know you don't have to think about. You can just look at the tape and you've got the information that you need to be able to essentially run through your ATLS algorithm the same way you guys have done hundreds and hundreds of times in this residency. Um, so that's, that's definitely one very, very important tool. If you look, um, like in PubMed or anywhere else, people will take Braslow uh, tape colors and have added all types of extra stuff in there. Um, we were looking at uh, using Braslow, Braslow tape colors to um, adapt like uh, Fogarty balloons for like small vessel Roboa or pediatric Roboa and stuff when I was in California. So um, the color sizes, the weights can correlate to lots of things, including like vessel size. Um, this is a newer measure uh, that people are starting to use. You can see that um, one of the things people worry about is, well, I don't really know the normal blood pressure for a one-year-old or two-year-old or four-year-old. So um, having a chart is helpful um, in your resuscitation day. But um, one tool that I've used is that in a one-year-old, systolic blood pressure should be around 100. Pulse should be around 100. So that's in a one-year-old. No baby should have a mean arterial pressure less than their estimated gestational age, and certainly not less than 40. Um, so that's in the babies. Uh, one thing that you can use is the shock index pediatric adjusted. Um, you can save it. That's three numbers to memorize instead of, I don't feel like doing the multiplication for the different numbers that you have to memorize. You can memorize that whole chart. Um, but ages uh, four to six, um, if their heart rate over their systolic blood pressure is greater than 1.22. Um, you need to start worrying. If it's greater than one, you start worrying. Greater than 0.9, you need to start worrying. Um, this has been validated in large civilian um, uh, series, but actually there is um, a newer data in the military population I'll get to, but SEPA identifies increased risk for emergency operation, blood transfusion, and endotracheal intubation. In some pre-hospital studies, it actually um, does better 
at um, identifying those things than uh, hypotension. Um, so this is a military series that was just published um, in the Journal of Trauma. Uh, this is a validation of shock index pediatric adjusted for children injured in war zones. Um, so it's a DOD TR review from 2008 to 2015. They use age less than 17 as a cutoff. Um, they looked at 2,000 patients. Of course, there's a high volume of penetrating trauma, um, a lot of um, combined blunt penetrating blast injuries. Um, elevated SEPA uh, in war zone um, predicted blood transfusion. Um, when they did their uh, linear regression, uh, it was an independent pr predictor of blood transfusion, independent predictor of um, emergency surgery. Uh, significantly associated with increased risk for ICU admission and mechanical ventilation. Um, especially uh, impressive is the negative predictive value. So if the SEPA is not elevated, then there's a, a high likelihood that there's not serious injury. Does that make sense? So it's, it's very sensitive, but not very specific. There's an Adobe warning that's popped up and taking control of your computer. There we go. Um, so we'll go through the ABCDE of trauma for you guys um, and just kind of break down some key differences. Again, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible and letting you rely on your excellent trauma training. Um, otherwise, so um, infants, small children are prone to airway obstruction. Um, they've got a relatively large tongue and full pharyngeal soft tissue. Um, infantile tracheal cartilage is more compliant. Uh, they've got a short trachea, so um, you have to be cautioned not to main stem them. They have a very large occiput. This isn't a burn lecture, but just to point out the differences in size of the heads, I've included the pediatric von Bauer chart here to show you that you know they're occipital surface, or their head surface area is twice that of, of an adult. Um, and then the narrowest part of the airway in a child is the cricopharyngeus, it's the glottis in an adult. Um, you need to use uh, adjuncts if available. Uh, so nasopharyngeal and, and oropharyngeal airways, um, they've got sizes based on Braslow color. Um, you know, usually those for nasopharyngeal, if it fits, it fits, um, so you can, Try it. There's not a whole lot of downside to trying that. And then oral pharyngeal airways. Uh, and then you can use a jaw thrust to um, get that big tongue out of the way. Um, definitive airway indications are the same as adult. GCS less than eight. Eight, to eight. Um, you know, any other concern about uh, potential loss of airway? Um, and so I'm not going to confuse you there. Uh, if you don't have a Braslow tape, age over four plus four is the ET tube size that you're going to use. The ET tube depth is the ET tube size times three. Makes it very easy. Um, and then anterior airway, uh, they you should get somebody to hold cricoid pressure for you. Cricoid pressure can really help with um, with um, intubating kids. Um, a shoulder roll to straighten the neck uh, also helps. Um, intubating kids, clearly we want to be conscious of the C collar and you can, if you're in uh, the United States and you've got ways to do fiber intubation or, or glide scope, you can use that certainly, but if you need to use a shoulder roll to straighten out the airway, airway first, um, always go ahead and do that. Um, in kids less than five years old, uh, I put software in here just to uh, emphasize that uh, usually, um, Pediatric anesthesiologists and most pediatric RSI algorithms will include at atropine before giving sedation medications. But ketamine, tomidate, um, or use you know, standard um, RSI meds would be appropriate and same for adults. Uh, they tend to get bradycardic um, in response to the inhibition of their airway. So um, most people will give them atropine. You talk to the peds anesthesiologist, they usually give it under age one, but they actually talked to Kat last night and she said, you know, under age five for inexperienced intubators.
Um, so surgical airway, um, your cricothyroidotomy that you're going to do in an adult patient who needs a surgical airway in an emergency isn't appropriate for kids. Their cricothyroid membrane is a lot shorter, smaller, not as robust, um, high rate of um, laryngeal injury if you try to do a surgical cricothyroidotomy in a patient less than 10 years old. Um, so the treatment of choice uh, until being able to convert to a definitive surgical tracheostomy um, is a needle crike. Um, or the kind of doctor word for that is percutaneous trans tracheal ventilation. You um, hook a 16 to 18 gauge needle up to high flow, and I'll show you some schematics about how to do this. Um, the I to E times, you have to allow passive ventilation. Um, I to E times can be as long as like one to six or one to eight. You just want to make sure that if there's chest rise, there's only chest fall. Um, otherwise, you can um, get uh, barotrauma. Uh, you've got about 45 minutes of jet ventilation before hypercarbia builds up um, and again convert to a surgical tracheostomy in the operating room when able. Um, so on the left is a typical jet ventilator. Um, we've got jet ventilation kits down in the emergency department, um, but you actually pull the trigger. You set a pressure. So there's proposed pressures here on the slide. Um, so you set a pressure, you hold the trigger for one second and then let off there for three seconds and there's a valve that allows passive exp expiration. If you don't have that, um, you can use uh, an angio cath. Um, you want to get like a small syringe with a little bit of saline uh, and then you know, hold, stabilize the, the trachea, insert the needle, and then advance the angio cath and then re-aspirate. So if you hook um, a jet ventilator up to a needle that's subcutaneous or in the wall of the trachea, you are going to cause disastrous complications for yourself when you start insufflating um, subintrusor or, or something else. So confirm that you're placed um, again after removing the, the needle, and then you can take a um, 3cc lower lock and it um, connects to a 7.5 endotracheal tube, and then you can bag. Um, so again, you looking for chest rise and then you, you want long um, expiratory times. Tape it or hold it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you, you, you need to tape it. Um, you should go in at a little bit of a um, superior to inferior angle. Uh, I don't know, have you guys ever done it? Have, has anybody here done a needle crike? The, you know, the algorithms include anesthesia and included PD anesthesia, like where I trained. And so we never had to do this, but I, I could see situations where, you know, you're downrange or wherever else where this would need to be done and you should know how to do it, potentially save a life. Breathing, um, they've got a very con compliant chest wall. So there's, uh, there's oftentimes um, pulmonary contusions without refractors. Um, in, in bad blunt trauma, like we'll see kids that are playing get hit by their parents, like backing out of driveways and stuff like that, who will end up um, with significant oxygen requirements due to pulmonary contusion. And there's absolutely no sternal or rib fractures. They've got a very mobile mediastinum, um, meaning tension physiology can develop rapidly. They've got a lot of reserves, so, so tension, um, actual tension physiology doesn't show up until it's extremely late in these kiddos. Uh, so same thing with um, with kids as in adults that um, uh, tension pneumothorax should be a clinical diagnosis. We don't necessarily have to wait on x-ray to decompress the chest. Um, so just because the kid don't treat them any different than you would uh, an adult who was coming in an extremis. Um, most injuries just like adults to the chest can be observed or treated with a tube thoracostomy you know, greater than 80 to 90% just like adults. Um, indications for thoracotomy for um, bleeding. So an initial hemorrhage of 25% of total body volume or blood volume, 15 cc per kilo or so, um, or continued hemorrhage, that's two to three mils per kilo for two to three hours. Um, Phil gave a talk on resuscitated thoracotomy. I won't beat the uh, horse to death, but um, really only penetrating trauma um, has there been shown to be any benefit. Uh, you want large bore IVI excess times two. Um, the sizes uh, based on your Braslow tape measurements 
Um, IO is preferred over central venous line. Um, there's a great uh, video on YouTube by the Easy IO company that's a little bit too long for us to watch together, but if anybody's got time, just go ahead and watch it. It talks about placing IOs in, in small kids. Um, there are series, post-mortem series showing that there's almost a 50% rate of not actually getting pediatric IOs into the marrow space. And I think that's probably a knowledge gap. And um, so you just need to go watch the video. And um, if you're at university and a kid comes in and needs one of these, then instead of the nurse doing this, maybe you should give it a shot. Um, it's actually quite easy because there's not a whole lot of outer tables available to get through. Um, so 20 cc per kilo crystalloid bolus is still, um, it's not a wrong answer for um, your initial, initial resuscitation maneuver. Uh, however, most uh, centers and pre-hospital, like in Houston, um, uh, are carrying uh, blood products and should be able to get blood products in as an initial resuscitation maneuver. 10 to 20 cc per kilo of pack cells um, as initial food is okay. I just caution you to realize that um, you know, circulating blood volume uh, in like an adult sized kid is about 70 cc's per kilo. So um, in small children, that goes up to 80 and preemies, 90, mm -hmm. almost 100 cc's per kilo. Um, so if you give 20 cc's per kilo of pack cells to a kid, um, you are giving, and they're, they're 80 cc's per kilo, you can work out the percentage of circulating blood volume you've already given back. Um, 40 cc's per kilo would be about half of their circulating blood volume, and that's actually the definition of um, a massive transfusion in kids. So I'm going to actually define that using JTTR data, um, looking at an inflection point in mortality with uh, blood products transfused, and there was a big inflection point that's 40 cc's per kilo, and so that's what they decided to name a massive transfusion for study purposes. And a lot of triggers and stuff like that in massive transfusion protocols in kids are based on that 40 cc per kilo uh, definition. Um, so there's no evidence against balanced transfusion. So if you're gonna use uh, uh, component therapy, uh, you need to be doing the same thing you do in adult one to one to one. Um, uh, but there's emerging evidence for low titer or whole blood. And my whole thing about peach trauma is trying to decrease cognitive load. It's super easy to draw up 10 cc per kilo of, of low titer or whole blood rather than looking at a complex um, chart or whatever for uh, for transfusion, and I've got, I'll show you a, a, a Brazo based chart for component therapy. Yes, yeah, I mean, all the risks are for transfusion are, are the, the same. Yeah, um, this is hot off the press. This is um, uh, PDF only. They were talking about this in meetings. Um, up to about a year ago. This is from uh, Pittsburgh, who's really been on the forefront of pushing out um, low titer or whole blood transfusion and pediatric trauma. Um, so low titer or whole blood and some of their series and some others um, have a good um, safety pr profile in kids. And there's some data that suggests it's got uh, improved survival in adults. Um, there's, there's some small series in, in pediatric trauma that demonstrate safety and efficacy. Uh, this paper is a single institution review of all massive transfusion patients. So they got greater than 40 cc per kilo um, of transfusion. And then they looked at um, who got low titer or whole blood versus um, conventional component therapy. So they identified 18 uh, or 80 children, uh, 27 received low titer or whole blood. Um, it was an independent predictor of decreased total transfusion volume. So um, seems to be effective at achieving their endpoints you know, with a lower volume. And then you can see um, that uh, conventional component therapy, there was a, a survival benefit that they demonstrated. Obviously, this is retrospective. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. There may have been other changes in their trauma protocols around the same time. Um, but still, I think this is promising and certainly warrants a closer look. Otherwise, you're stuck with something like this, um, where you're looking at component therapy. And you can see that um, you're using relatively small volumes here, um, especially when you're below, you know, yellow or so. 
But if you're mm -hmm. telling a nurse to give one to one to one resuscitation of a kid, um, it's very easy to oversuscitate a whole unit of blood is essentially here at one week. So after this, it's a pretty much perfect to use units of blood and increments, right? But below that, putting a whole unit of blood is um, is not appropriate and can lead to oversuscitation and essentially oversuscitating of pack cells without any factor, right? So if you give 40 cc per kilo pack cells and you give them no factor, then you dilute it out further their ability to form clot. That's why I think we should just be using low titer or whole blood. Um, so th that's from the bear hugger website. I thought that was really funny. Um, <laughs> But, but um, I've, I've definitely seen, you know, kids uh, in a, were in a car crash. They were probably pretty warm when they got in their car crash. And then between their car crash and the time they get to you and the trauma bay, you know, somebody has had them on the side of the road trying an IV. And then they were probably trying IVs and IOs and all types of other stuff in the ambulance. And then they get to the resuscitation bay and then you guys know what happens. Everything's off. There's no blankets. There's nothing. And they get very, very cold very, very quickly. The leading cause of death is, um, is uh, uh, head trauma. Um, so I've seen some very cold patients exsanguinate in the operating room um, from craniotomies because they were brought in cold. So um, it's your job as the quarterback in the trauma bay to make sure that we are keeping these kids covered and warm because they can lose body heat very, very, very quickly. And then, you know, in between cases, you can go snuggle with the bear. Uh, so we'll talk about a little um, region, injury by region sort of specific uh, stuff here. As we know, GCS can be difficult to assess in nonverbal children. Um, uh, imaging is based on, uh, you know, decline and mechanism. There's, there's some PCAR and calculators and algorithms. I've got actually at the end of the PowerPoint we can go through if you guys want, but they're available. You can, MD Calc has got the PCAR and calculator on it. If you, if you just Google whether or not you want to get a, a, a CT scan for um, a head injury in a kid. Um, otherwise, it's usually a pretty low uh, threshold for getting a head CT, especially, I mean, if they're up to get a head CT. Um, C-spine injury is actually pretty rare. Um, uh, when it does happen, there is an in increased incidence of spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormality, um, just because of uh, increased relative cranial size and, and some laxity in, um, in some of the uh, soft tissue of the spine. Um, first line is, is usually a plain film, just AP and lateral spine. Um, again, there's lots of algorithms out there, um, the Nexus and Canada algorithms, um, for whether or not you should get a, a CT scan. Um, you know, I, I usually have a relatively low um, threshold for it. If, if you think about it and, and um, you're worried, especially based on the exam, then go ahead and get it. The, you know, worrying about radiation risk is nothing compared to worrying about worrying about um, missing an injury. And so that's another point of anxiety where people think everybody's gonna get all mad if they get a CT scan. Um, I think you know, there's a time and a place for that. Oh, there's a, a GCS um, for the verbal, for the nonverbal kids there. Um, so I like the you know, if they follow social media or like want like a cell phone, that sort of stuff, then they're probably okay. Um, extra points, anybody's actually read this paper, but it's in one of the chapters in our not a textbook. Uh, so Dr. Hale back in 2015 published this. Um, so C-spine injury is more common in multiply injured children in extremis. So if you've got a, a kid who's, you know, GCS3 and obtunded, then just go ahead and get the CTC spine. 82% um, of kids with a um, clinically significant C spine injury will have an abnormal neuro exam. Um, are the adult uh, trauma surgeons clearing C spines and obtunded patients based on normal CT scan here? No, they're getting MRIs on all those patients. I think it depends on depends on the staff. And there's a series of a thousand adult patients where even if 
patients did have a ligamentous injury. Um, Even in practice, I think if the CCC is fully normal, then the full patients have been um, just the real responsive. But if there are any like abnormalities or degenerative changes, then it's hard to uh, If it, it's not possible to do more, the way we do patient from the status of the other, it's more of like all the yeah, so um, there's a thousand patient series that justifies that practice um, where um, there was an, you know, an incidence of, there's like 9% ligamentous injuries and these are tons of patients, but none of them were unstable, like say zero were unstable. Um, that cannot be extrapolated to kids yet. That data doesn't exist yet. Um, and with the higher incidence of spinal cord injury without radiologic abnormality, kids still need an MRI. Um, uh, APSA has been putting out these um, visual abstracts. Uh, if you guys have access to not a textbook, which Diane said, I haven't tested it yet in the library, but the APSA not a textbook has very good um, feeds trauma chapters if you want to review. And has been, they've been publishing these um, visual abstracts to help um, with uh, kind of hot button topics. And one of them is, you know, who doesn't need imaging? So um, you can see kind of modified nexus criteria over there. So if you've got no neuro deficit, no midline tenderness, no distracting injury, no explained hypotension, and you're not less than three with a high risk mechanism intoxicated or obtunded, then you don't need imaging at all. Um, but if you are um, less than three years old, fall grade in 10 feet, um, MVC uh, uh, with, you know, any of those things uh, or non-accidental trauma, then you need a, at least AP lateral plane films. Um, and then we already talked about the obtunded patient over there. Are they, are they suggesting scanning everyone involved in the MVC? No. Um, so I was actually a little bit confused by that as well. Uh, you have to go dig into the chapter a little bit. Um, but mm -hmm. what they want to say is that um, if you are concerned about the mechanism, then just get an AP and lateral is fine. It's not that much radiation. And if you've got you know, any clinical concern, like if they're having pain, it's you know, definitely get an AP and lateral or a CPC. Um, so Chest, most common injuries are pulmonary contusion in pneumothorax. Uh, usually, plain films are sufficient. Um, you can get CT scans based on concerning findings on x-ray. Uh, one thing I do have to caution is um, the calling of a wide mediastinum in kids. Um, it's not very um, sensitive or specific in children, especially small children, because their thymic border is bigger than adults generally. Um, <laughs> And so it tends to get overcalled and there's no standard definition. Um, again, mostly this is based on clinical concern, but if there's concerning findings on x-ray and pneumomediastinum, um, especially um, you know, large pneumothorax and they're stable, then you can get a CT of the chest. Um, but routine screening like the PAN scan uh, should be omitted because the injuries are very, very rare. Um, ad, unstable patients or abdomen, uh, the, the assessment parallels adults. I, I hate this algorithm on the right. The only reason I put it there is because um, oftentimes if you're on the border or the, on the fence about scanning a kid's abdomen, um, instead of going straight to CT scan, you can get labs as a screening tool um, and or admit for serial exams. Uh, so uh, getting LFTs, uh, it doesn't have on there a lipase, but LFTs, lipase, and a UA um, will screen for the vast majority of, um, of blunt solid organ injuries that you're looking for on CT scan. Um, a fast exam in small kids, I usually think about less than two, but maybe down to five, especially females. There may be some physiologic pelvic fluid, um, so don't take a kid to the operating room based on that. Um, and the indication for operation is the same as adults. Um, uh, and then stable patients is the algorithm there. So unstable patients, you know, if you've got 
even if you're unstable and you got a positive fast, it's um, the same thing as you would do for alpha for an adult patient. Um, one of the other differences, and this could be its own to topic and actually is, there's videos of this being presented at, um, at meetings. Now, this is the updated blunt liver and spleen injury guidelines as of 2019. Um, uh, there's a big push for non-operative management for these, and rightfully so. The vast majority of even high-grade injuries um, won't require any intervention at all. So we treat the patient um, based on their physiology rather than the grade of their injury. So that was actually, I don't know if any of you guys, I think some people back there work with Marcy McVeigh when she was here, but that was her work that she did in, in Arkansas showing that um, you can have a grade five liver or spleen injury and you respond to initial resuscitation and you're stable um, uh, in some centers, uh, they wouldn't even admit that patient to the ICU. Um, so ICU admission indicators have normal vital signs after initial volume resuscitation. Um, if you're in the ICU, you're limited to bed rest and you're getting a few six hour CBCs uh, in your MPO. Um, if you go to, straight to the ward, they don't put activity restrictions on people. Uh, you know, CBC on admission, Q6, all the algorithms that I've seen after this came out are a little bit different. Um, I think I, I would keep patients in PO if I'm trending CBCs. It doesn't really make any sense to me to let them eat. Um, uh, procedures, uh, so you give transfusions for those criteria over there on the right. Angioembolization is a good choice um, uh, with the same controversies as adults. Um, without a whole lot of long-term follow-up, but it's not indicated just for a contrast blush alone. So contrast blushes either in the liver or the spleen don't um, on their own independently require angioembolization. And then operative exploration, we just went over. You're going to explore uh, kids based on the same criteria as you would ex explore an adult with unstable vital signs and want uh, trauma to the abdomen. Um, so discharge, people used to keep these kids in the hospital forever, but um, letting them go is based on their clinical condition, not injury severity. So if you're tolerating diet, minimal abdominal pain, normal vital signs that they can go. Um, and then activity restriction, activity uh, restrictions are great plus two weeks. Um, they are trying to generate more data on that for like you know, kids who play football, baseball, whatever, um, and want to get back to sports. Uh, routine follow-up imaging, um, we don't perform in kids um, because delayed complications are, are very low. Um, you should image symptomatic patients with prior high-grade injuries. There's still risk in liver injury for bioma um, and kidney injury for uh, urinoma, even though it's used for spleen, that sort of stuff. Um, yes. Yes. Um, all right, summary, kids have unique physiology based on age of maturity, um, but remember, just focus on your ATLS guide, like guideline principles. There's really only a few things you can see that, that really differ that are the key things. Um, so, uh, try not to um, let this be one of those points of high anxiety for you. Um, and the best way to get rid of the anxiety, honestly, is to be around it more. Uh, so I've heard the experience that you age is kind of hitting this, but that's the best way to, you know, make sure that you're there and very active and involved in those resuscitations so that it becomes a little bit more old hat for you. Um, and then any questions? No. Uh, Saline or LI. Um, there are guidelines for 3% administration in head injury. Um, uh, I said, we're writing an institutional guideline here right now 
for it as well. But yeah, just same thing to use for everything. What's up? Can you talk about your algorithm for a kid who arrests in front of you after going to trauma? So um, I would then book chess. Um, and then uh, if they don't respond to that, so I actually have seen that tension with thorax. He's been at the chest and the kid like sits up right after he's at the chest. Um, and then it's just going to be CPR essentially. It, I have not seen a blunt trauma arrest like in the trauma bed. It wasn't something like reversible, um, like right away, like tampon Um Yeah, they like, I don't know. It's usually like the scenario in the ER where they've arrested in the, on scene. Maybe there's a report of ROSC at some point, but um, it's usually pretty immediate. The, you got to remember the leading cause of death in these kids is overwhelmingly head injury. Like it's just like 80, 90%. Mm -hmm. um, penetrating trauma is different, completely different. And actually, they presented data at AXA last week that showed that gunshot wounds are leading, leading cause of death in kids in this country as of last year. And uh, there's a higher percentage now than there ever has been of non accidental gunshot wounds. <clears throat> yes. If it's blood injury, then pericardiosis, which I'd have to, I mean, that would make, give me anxiety, but um, I'll try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there anybody online? Maggie, are you there? Did you have any comments? Um, the only thing maybe to add is the whole like submitting to ICU versus floor is, you know, when there is a actual ICU and an actual floor. So just low threshold to admit to a higher level of care depending on your institution and where you are. Yeah, we were high volume institution. We still admitted grade four and five injuries to ICU despite the new guideline. So I don't know what they were doing. At Vanderbilt, but this all came out like right after uh, I graduated. So we still definitely admitted more to the ICU and had longer lengths to stay. Anything else that they should know? Did you hear Travis's question? What would you do uh, with no, a blunt trauma that arrests in the in the trauma bay, like in front of you? Yeah, I agree with what you said. I mean. The, I think the time I've seen that it was the head injury, like isolated head injury that was radiating down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks, guys.